Dear folks of Baba, a seeker came to his master begging to be relieved of his ongoing suffering. The master listened, listened patiently and promised he would honor his request, provided he would carry out one order, to go into the city and knock at every door and find someone who has not suffered. The seeker went from door to door and could find no one. What is the place of suffering in our spiritual life that our heart inevitably endures? We all have experienced many disappointments in our lives, such as betrayal, injustice, humiliation, prejudice, that have seemed totally uncalled for and hurt us deeply. Have you noticed in retrospect that they were really blessings in disguise? That they awakened an awareness and empathy in us that wasn't there before? Have you found that sometimes suffering has brought about a spiritual healing in you? Have you had times with Baba when you've suffered emotionally in life at the hands of your fellow beings and have doubted that it had much to do with Baba and your spiritual growth? You might have thought, the loving things that happen to me come from Baba, and the unloving things that <laughs> the unloving things that happen are done by others. You may even know that this is not true, but your heart and mind convince you that others are responsible and not our all loving beloved. Fortunately, in retrospect, we see that many of the untoward things that have happened to us have awakened compassion in us that wasn't there before. For example, if we have gone through a divorce and all the usual profound pain that that entails, we are not so flippant in our reaction when a friend is going through a breakup? Breakup. Yep. Have you suspected that maybe it is Baba who, through others, causes these hurts to the heart so that we learn to let go of the mind and live permanently in the heart, to value the heart above all else? Mani once said, nothing happens to you without Baba's knowing approval. <sighs> Last time on the topic of blind spots, one of you shared an insight regarding the benefits of what we might be suffering by asking Baba, why are you doing this for me rather than to me? In your own life, after you've gone through a painful situation, are there times when you've seen a silver lining in the whole thing? How did this play out? Sometimes weaknesses and emotional complexes last for years or are never really overcome. What effect does that have on your pride of progress and the experience of humility and empathy? Have your shortcomings and inadequacies forced you to, to depend on Baba and not always on yourself? Have you had to seek help from others, maybe even a professional? How do you, how do you live with someone, something? How do you live with something in you that won't change, even with your best efforts to get help from Baba and others? Mani, Baba's sister, used to quote the line, I prayed to you for strength to carry out your work. You gave me weakness so I would depend on you. <laughs> Bao Kalchuri, one of the intimate Mandali, used to say, sometimes it takes a nightmare to wake us up from a pleasant dream. Would any of you be willing to share a painful experience that in retrospect proved invaluable in awakening the inner life and deeper compassion for others? Mm, have you experienced through the suffering of the heart how profoundly we share with others a commonality of human experience that gives us some sense of oneness with others, which Baba has spoken so eloquently about? Those who have been addicted to alcohol or other substances, for example, have experienced a spiritual awakening through the 12-step programs and have been connected to others at a very deep level, people they might never have met otherwise. Have you sometimes felt that when you are suffering continually in a situation, even though you've had the best of intentions, you worry that you must have done something profoundly wrong? For example, you've shown kindness to someone for years, and suddenly they turn on you. 
a sweet reminder. Baba told us the remedy and comfort for all ills is to constantly remember me wholeheartedly. Can you see a possible trajectory through, through suffering to understanding, to empathy, to full compassion and acceptance of what Baba gives us? Doesn't this lead us to remember him more readily and with gratitude? With loving help from dear friends in Baba, Jeff, J. Bob. <clears throat> that was a little longer than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyone want to venture out? Um, because uh, like anyone, is there anyone who actually came to Baba through uh, uh, an intense suffering? You know, I mean, an actual period of intense suffering that actually brought them to Baba. Anyone? <laughs> Anyone have? Oh, okay, good. I, I don't really want to open a can. Uh-oh, Tony. Can you hear Tony? Uh, I'm uh, better now. I yeah, good. Um, I, I don't mean to open a can of worms here, um, but I, I definitely came to Baba through a period of in, uh, an experience of intense suffering. Um, I, I can't tell the whole story. You, you can read it about it in my book, Playing With Fire. <laughs> it's on Amazon, but I'll tell you just this part that's relevant here. It was um, January 30th, 1969, and I went to bed, and I had been feeling for the prior four or five months that whatever it is that makes life life is dying. That's the only way I could put it into terms. And so I had withdrawn from my friends. From I'd go to school, and I'd go up to my room. And um, on January 30th, I went to sleep and had an experience. I, I suddenly woke up, uh, and it's kind of like if, if you left a gas jet on and you suddenly realize it, you have an intuition and you get up and go down to, to turn off the gas jet. It was like that. Something woke me like that. And I looked out the window and there were two, uh, the, the tenant of our basement apartment and another man. And the two of them looked like members of the underworld. They were in heavy trench coats and they had a, heavy kind of ominous feel about them and then they went down the driveway into the walk-in basement apartment that we my mother rented and uh, because my father had died when I was nine I was told you have to be the man of the house now and look after the house and your mother and your brother so I um I ran downstairs and then I ran down to the basement because what are they doing in my house I have to go to protect my house and um, I got there, and I'm in the hallway facing the tenant's apartment, and suddenly everything goes into extreme, vivid experience. I think it's what we experience when we die, where Baba says the flesh is not in the way, so you get the full intensity of experience. But I look, and there is a, a beautiful woman who, and I'm like 16 years old at the time, a beautiful woman who um, who I know so well. I have no idea in my actual normal life, but at this moment, I know her so well. There is so much love that flows between us. She reaches out her hand to take mine, and I reach out and take hers. And there's this moment that's like an eternal moment, and it, it just it seems to last forever, and a very love-filled moment. And suddenly it gives way to time again. And I, I see the open apartment door slightly open behind her. And I know those two members of the underworld are in there. There's a sort of a dim light. And something is pulling her into that room. And um, at first, like, you know, we I try to ignore it, but it's, I described it later as a force as powerful as destiny. 
there was nothing either of us could do to prevent her being pulled into that room where clearly something not great is going to happen to her. Um, and it, it accelerates and accelerates and I, the anxiety and the terror. And I look, it reaches the point where I glance down and our hands have come apart like that. Kind of like in the story of Orpheus and Eurydice when she's drawn back into the underworld. And um, at that moment, I was facing what felt like ap ex existential annihilation. And at, at that very moment, someone uh, suffering beyond anything I could imagine. And at that very moment, a voice spoke and boom, with a flash, the whole thing was gone. And it was, it was as if we used to do a diorama, you know, in the Museum of Natural History, they have big dioramas that um, showing in prehistoric times, you know, the woolly mammoth and the cavemen. And in, in elementary school, we um, made dioramas out of shoe boxes and with little plastic figurines and stuff. And it felt, now at the moment, it was, I, the impact was immediate, but later, this is how I can describe it. Um, it was as if the, we were in this shoebox diorama and this drama was playing out and the person who spoke, very compassionate, such compassion in the voice, was like a full-sized human watching this with great um, caring and attention. And just at the moment, at the same time, the words seemed to come from everywhere, all around me. And at the same time, it seemed to come from a place deep within me, so deep within me that I could not see that far down in me. So it came from like all these three senses of what it was. And, and the word, the word it spoke was 303, 303. And I, I, and everything was gone and at some point um, I began to be conscious at a regular level of consciousness again and I became aware of my head and then I became aware my head was lying on a pillow and then I became aware that the pillow was drenched in tears and that my lips were repeating over and over 303 303 303 303 Eventually, I, the mind started to kick in because the mind was out of commission. But then one thought, then another, like gears locking together. And it, the mind started functioning again. And I thought, what the hell was that? And um, I looked to the wind, out the window and there was nothing unusual out there. Um, I looked at the, the, my clock radio, what was like 1.45 a.m., uh, which was 12 15 p.m in india uh, on january 31st um but um I, for, I had a brief thought i had a clock radio that you could set it to listening to music and it would turn off at a certain point and i even had the thought well well maybe it was like a song i heard on the radio maybe it was the beatles when i'm 64 and instantly this powerful energy in me said no it was 303 303 uh, I went down to the basement. I went down to see, uh, down to the first floor, down to the basement, in the hallway. The air was still. If anyone had been there and come in, opened the door, there would have been movement in the air. There was no movement. Um, the tenant's door was closed. I could hear him snoring. It was very clear that no one had been there. And I went back, came upstairs to my, my bedroom. <laughs> and finally decided, well, clearly this is something that could not possibly have happened. Oh, because I also did not know who this woman was. In the experience, I knew. I knew her better than I've ever known anyone or myself. But now I have no idea who it is. And I resolved that, well, like Keats had this thing called negative capability to be at home with opposites uh, that are irreconcilable and to be comfortable with that. And I just said, well, this is something that could not possibly have happened, but absolutely, without any shadow of a doubt, did happen and with great intensity. 
And with that, I fell asleep. The next morning, life had been reborn. It was whatever it is that makes life life was suddenly pouring out of everything. I, I, I don't want to tell, this is a big story, but so I won't. But that evening, I happened to glance, someone asked me to join a band, and I happened to glance at the sunset, and it was like something out of Cecil B. DeMille, like God had lit, lit, lifted, filled the sky with color. And I set out, anyway, I made a decision to find this woman, whoever, wherever she was, and to find out what this 303 meant. Because what a strange word, strange, un unusual. And I had the thought, maybe when I find her, maybe she's had a similar experience. Maybe when I find her, she'll know what the 303 meant. And that starts my story. But the suffering, and that's how I came to Baba. Within, that's how Baba came to me. But <laughs> a year later, how when I recognized, saw Baba's picture, I immediately recognized him. Um, so it was from a moment of unspeakable suffering <laughs> uh, that I came to Baba. And and there's, and there's a good story connected with that that lasts yes. for ten years. Well, what was uh, what did uh, the three hundred three stand for? Oh no no, it's like it's like no this the story has so many elements and it is a mystery. I did not find out what three hundred three meant until uh -huh. nineteen eighty. This uh -huh. was nineteen sixty nine, and that's. That's why I had to write it up as a book because it's yeah. you don't give away the, the well maybe the maybe toward the end you can you can <laughs> of this you can uh, 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 relieve us of our suspense. Oh no, I, you know <laughs> I, en I endured it for, I endured it for eleven or twelve years. So you know if you really just interested get the book get the I'm book okay. I, I do have I'm not, not even breaking even so yeah. okay <laughs> all right anybody else want to yes. I have a question about, about tony's story one little bit of a question about those what happened the two guys in trench coats what happened to them what was the significance of those two guys they were the underworld well, that's what I thought of at the time. I was thinking it would be symbolic of the, not right away. I didn't even think about them. All I was thinking about was this woman and that something bad was going to happen to her in there. Um, you had I, not I, only heard the joke about the guy with the <clears throat> chicken and the trench going to the movie. With... Yeah, that's a funny thing. This was not funny. <laughs> no. No. Anyone else? Uh, want to say something about suffering <laughs> and and its value oh good we got a couple of it was, it was a pity uh pan thing yeah <laughs> i am um, i've told this story before but i think it's perfect for here is that a a cousin of ours who's a rabbi was sitting with his mother who was asleep in ICU and he was holding her hand with one hand and he was staring at the heart monitor and zoning on it and realizing that it was going up and down, up and down. And he had congregates that would always say to him, Rabbi, why are there so many ups and downs? <laughs> and he felt that a flat line meant no life. And yeah. It, it was, what'd you say? Excellent, yeah. So it's been a, a, an analogy and a visual that I, go, that I go through a lot. And having our child here for the last two weeks in a small quarters, I, I, I felt the suffering of disconnection at times. And then I realized by not pushing it and really giving it over to Baba, which... He was very busy being called on by me the last two weeks. Um, it allowed space to happen, not necessarily on my time, but it did happen. And I wouldn't have felt the joy I felt with their love. I think at sometimes without knowing the crap and the suffering that come also sometimes with being a parent. 
And then I just realized this was being recorded. <laughs> was and, <it? laughs> so you were you were able to kind of just you didn't uh, go with the ups and downs. You just kind of remain patient, and in the end, it, it, with the disconnection from your daughter, but then eventually it came around. We we thought a lot about Terry and I talked a lot about when Jeff talks about detachment and really um, practicing that that usually the things that they were moody about and um, pissy about had nothing to do with us and the old me would have taken it personally and um, yeah. I would have done backflips to try and rectify it and this time I would just breathe in and detach. And it wasn't about me. And when it was about me, I, I, I took it like a, the woman that I am, scared and you no. Know. <laughs> uh -huh. But in the end, but the, at the end, it, 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 Baba kind of harmonized things, would you say? Beautifully. Beautifully. Yeah. Beautifully. We got the hug that we had both wanted to, when we said goodbye, which was yeah. really nice. Yeah. That recent quote that's come up about Baba, where Baba says, I tell you, don't worry, be happy. Why? Because I know the ending and the ending is beautiful. You know, if we can just bear with him. <laughs> but I but I always have an issue with that when I because it goes right into my brain instead of my heart. And that is, you know, I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer here, but for the people who in the past week had the audacity of waking up and living their life and 23 shootings happened here in America. Oh, I, I Maybe. know. So did everything work out in the end or am I just not seeing the bigger picture that these people needed to move on to? Right, another? you're not seeing the bigger picture. They could <clears throat> that or died from liver cancer it doesn't really matter it was their time for whatever Bubba's reason was yeah. or like Monty used to say it all has a happy ending but <laughs> it's a long uh it's a long ways away yeah. it could be okay I'm let's go with oh Jennifer Jennifer yeah Hi, everybody. I'm putting my yeah. hand down, too. Look yeah. at me. I know how to work this stuff now. Um, so I just kind of got a hit that I should tell this little story. I can't say, yeah, you know, I think we all have different levels of suffering in our life. And I certainly have had some, but certainly I would say less than others, maybe more than some. But so I was in a period of intensely pitying and feeling sorry for myself with my situation going through divorce and what it meant with family and children and all of that. And so I was, I decided to um, just quiet my mind by going and doing something. And so I went to this little flea market out in the country here in Kentucky. And so I'm at the flea market, I'm wandering around. I don't want anything. I just needed to be somewhere. And I look in this little room and there's a table with a bunch of stuff on it. And I just get this feeling that I should go take a look. And so I go look and, and on this table is a big mass of kind of costume jewelry, you know, just kind of junky stuff and rings and pendants and this and that. And then I just, and I thought, well, I'm just going to keep walking. And there was something about it that made me need to look further and look deeper into it. So I kind of moved things around. And then I found what was absolutely the most surprising thing. And I'm going to show it to you because you guys will recognize it. It was one of those pins. Um, I guess this one is from India of Baba. And I don't know if I can put it up to the, where's the camera right there. Yeah, yeah. That little picture. So yeah. isn't that the coolest thing? So out of this time of feeling miserable and trying to kind of calm my mind with it all, I just felt like I 
So I, oh, and I asked the guy, you know, did he know what it was? And he said, I don't know. And I said, well, how much do you want for it? And he said, I don't know, a quarter. So I thought that was a good deal. So anyway, so that was, gosh, now about 10 years ago. But, you know, during my times of looking back on, after that, looking back on other times, you know, I thought, okay, Bob has been with me. And I can look back many, many times now, even before I knew of Baba, and I can see things that show me that even during those times of difficulty, he was there. So it gives me hope for the future because I'm sure I'm going to have some more suffering because isn't that part of our lives? But just to get, you know, have a little button show up or some little thing happen, I think it is just such a wonderful gift that Baba, not always, but at times gives us to let us know that he's with us in the suffering and uh, he's a part of it. So that's my story. Beautiful, Jennifer. Beautifully shared. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh, okay. Priya? Yeah. Hi, Jay Baba, everyone. Jay okay, Baba, yeah. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, this is uh, my coming to Baba's story, one would say. And this happened uh, way back in 2017 uh, when I was uh, deeply heartbroken. And um, so much so that I just couldn't make sense of anything, I couldn't even breathe, I couldn't sleep. It was the most painful thing I'd ever experienced. And uh, someone who wasn't even my friend, because you know some of the other friends were quite worried as to what was happening, just thought that it would be best to just take me and drop me at Marabad. And probably on the way from Bombay to Marabad, they spoke to me about Baba. But I don't remember anything registering, nothing. And I remember reaching uh, the Samadhi and we were standing in the line. And all I remember is having this uh, familiar feeling that he is the God of love. That's all I remember, that he is the God of love. And of course, there were a lot of tears. And then finally, some Baba lover chose to give me a 10 seconds hug. And that finally brought some quiet with it. I could breathe. I could just sit there for a while. So that had to happen. But it was on my last trip to Meribad. I was talking to Margie. And I don't know how the conversation happened. And I was telling her that when I was six, I started reading Rajneesh Osho. I don't know, too many people know, but he was a mystic and an Indian philosopher um, who started the Rajneesh movement in Oregon, uh, I think, in the US. He used to say that, you know, when you're dancing, forget the dancer, become the dance. When you love, forget the lover, become love. And I think at the age of, um, you know, learning that at that young age, for me, love was really just that, forgetting the self. And thus there was no concept of boundaries of self-interest of anything. And, and that was how I felt I loved this person. And Margie commented, she said, well, that had to happen. You had no space for Baba. Baba had to break through that to create space for himself which sort of connected the dots for me. And it did remind me of what Jeff always says that you have to keep letting go. You have to keep creating room within for him to grow. So yes, in suffering and in pain is when, you know, we break through things and, and find him. So that's my one little- Wow, beautifully, very touching, wow. Boy, lovely. Ooh, Jay Baba. 
Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hi, Jeff. Hey. And everyone. Yeah. Um, just yes to everything you wrote in the email, Jeff. Were, were you thinking about me when you wrote some of that? Uh, yeah, I was channeling you, actually. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, but yeah, um, you know, just sometimes I, there's more than once when life has seemed to be going along swimmingly and all of a sudden something totally shocking, stunning, unbelievable can happen. And um, as I say, pretty much what you said, you know, turning to Baba more deeply, uh, really remembering that this is all a dream and everyone and everything in it has to be let go on the personal sort of everyday level, you know, to find to find the deeper connection beyond this this life. But that's that's uh, so difficult in many ways. And um, so you got to thank Baba for forcing me to let a lot of things go <laughs> in the last three or four years. Um, yeah, you you have yeah, you have had to bear a lot and you've taken it very gracefully, I would say. I don't think I would have been able to take it as gracefully as you did. I'm not sure I'm 100% there yet, but also I wanted to say yeah, the support, the unexpected support from all, so many of you um was essential, I guess, you know, when it it could not have been wasn't necessarily had to be that way. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. There were some hands up earlier. Akash. Okay, Baba. And this is not a story of uh, coming to Baba because of suffering, but it's suffering that happened <laughs> after I was born into a Baba family and everything. Uh, I was uh, working for a company uh, that used to do what you call training simulators for uh, certain uh, companies that uh, you know do oil, I mean oil refining and all that stuff. And I was in one of the, the projects uh, that uh, that was sponsored by a Japanese company, and um, it was tough. I mean, you're trying to replicate real life using uh, computers that were not that uh, powerful at the time. <laughs> and we did our best, but then the thought in the company was that, oh God, I mean, you're working with this company. These, these guys are tough. I mean, they, they always uh, want everything that, that they specify in their specifications. So, I mean, we did our best and, and it was like, um, and then there was this uh, thing called a site acceptance test. And for that, you actually have to go to their company and perform the test after setting up the whole thing. And uh, that was a job and uh, people uh, back home, they, they, they scared me. They scared the hell out of me by saying that, look, you're going for, uh, to this guy, this company, and you, you're going to pay for it. And now my imagination went wild and I was scared and everything and worked hard before going. And I went there. <clears throat> And it was obviously not that easy. Uh, it was really uh, a demanding situation where the client would ask for everything under the sky. And then, uh, and then you have to produce it. You have to show it. And, and we know we can do it. <clears throat> so I went there imagining that uh, things are going to be really, really difficult and all that stuff. And then I was at some point praying that the earth would open up and swallow me, that kind of situation. So working hard and all that stuff. And <clears throat> once I went there and uh, it was uh, late nights, every day working till two in the night and all that stuff, getting back home, I'm in the hotel. <laughs> And um, luckily, um, I had food to get from the Japanese uh, train stations where they would serve food if you plug money into the uh, machines and that kind of thing. Anyway, so I would go home and then I literally would 
pray to Baba from my heart saying that, please, Baba, help me out. Please, Baba, help me out. Every day for all those 15 days I was there. But, um, you know, I mean, these guys, uh, after all that imagination that made me so worried about the whole thing, uh, we, uh, they did the test and said that these, these things you still have to work on and get it right and uh, that kind of thing. And at the end of the day, I found out after the whole thing was over and I was coming back, I realized the whole thing was not as difficult as it seemed to be uh, before I went there. Even though it was uh, working, you know, uh, long hours and all that stuff. So from this experience, uh, that what I learned basically was we imagine more than what the situation would be. And uh, that definitely definitely has helped me. I mean, obviously praying to Baba, I'm sure Baba did his job trying to assuage my fears and everything. But uh, we walked out <laughs> of the whole test that was run there with few problems and uh, which we could uh, address to some extent. But uh, that taught me a life uh, lesson wherein I learned that we always imagine more than what, uh, uh, what, is, what we walk into. And that that can create worry that can drag you down. So after that, I realized that um, I should be worrying about things of which we know little about and just uh, go through it and things will work, uh, work out ultimately. And that, that was a beautiful lesson. And given that after that, now I, I don't really worry about things uh, much at all. And it's also my nature not to worry about things. <laughs> but this uh, experience there definitely did help me quite a bit. Thanks to Baba yeah. and thanks <laughs> yeah. for all his support. Yeah. I'm reminded of uh, Mark Twain's line. I've been through many trials and tribulations in this life. And most of them never happened. Yeah. No, that's so true, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there is one more thing I thought I'll just quickly share. Uh, here is um, something that Baba wrote to Kimco. Uh, you all know about uh, the group Kimco. I, I don't know if it's a single person or the whole group Baba is referring With to here. Number of women, yeah. Yeah. So Baba says here, your heart is so wonderful, always feeling so deeply and truly and responsive to the call and understanding. But that peculiar mind of yours at times wobbles and tries to shake your faith while your love receives it all, uh, revives it all again and afresh. One moment you feel quite prepared to do and withstand anything. The next moment you hesitate with ifs and buts and feel depressed and worried unnecessarily. So here Baba says it's not only you who suffer, I also do my part in order to make you not suffer. So Baba's answer is, but I will see that this eternal struggle between head and the heart for you as well as for all others who suffer from the same weakness ends eventually in the victory of the head, sorry, heart or the head <laughs> and brings about a blending of the two. In fact, I'm working at it suffering myself almost all the while by being misunderstood every moment and in every act of compassion in raising the consciousness and understanding of humanity to a higher level. So it's not only us <laughs> who go through all that stuff, suffering, so-called suffering, but uh, he does uh, a lot for us, yeah. Infinitely more than, yeah, we, yeah. we got it easy. <laughs> Jay Bob. Yeah. Masha. Well, your topics are very timely. I've just had a couple of very strange experiences. I was getting ready. I had to pack to a condo and leave the Pilgrim Center on the same day. And then I was going to go to a hotel and ended up going somewhere else. But Jeff came and helped me. I kind of panicked. 
because I couldn't fit all my stuff in the car, including the dog. So I ended up in the woods. And then this last year I had trouble with the transport company. And anyway, I let them know where I was going to be picked up and then I'm getting ready to leave. And I um, go to, I, I'm supposed to leave on the airplane uh, at like mm, four in the afternoon. And they called me up and said, well, I'll meet you at coming to the Kroger at 10 o'clock. So I drive my car to the Kroger and I'm waiting for this guy to come. And he says, where are you? The dispatcher didn't change the address from last year. So they went to the Kroger by the Galleria instead of North Myrtle Beach. So that was about an hour. So the gentleman shows up and he's wearing sandals. This is very bizarre, right? He's wearing sandals and I'm at the Kroger gas station. And he comes out and he says, oh, and he's taking pictures. And I'm thinking, oh, fine. I'm very trusting. He's looking at the car. Sign here. And then I, after he leaves, I look and there's no truck, you know. So the attendant says, oh, you know, did he st steal your car? And I didn't have, if I trusted him. And then all of a sudden I'm starting to let that fear creep in, right? Look, where's my car? And then I said, well, anything in there, I got insurance, right? And she says, you have to act on it quick. Call the police. And I said, no, what if he didn't really steal the car and I call the police, right? So this was me catching myself because I did feel that panic right away. Like, oh my God, I lost my car and I'm here and there's, I'm in, at a Kroger and the sun's shining out. So anyway, I caught, I, Jackie came to rescue me, Jackie. And um, I'm sitting in the car and I'm trying to find the original text from the company because now I start getting, thinking, well, maybe this was somebody hacking me and whatever. But anyway, the guy said, oh yeah, that's your car. We have a picture of it. So I went back and I go to the airport. And when I get to the airport, there's nobody there. It's a time of day when it should be loaded with people, right? And so I, I'm, the plane is still on the ground. So I go to the counter. There's nobody there but a lady who's like 80 years old, right? And she looks very strange. And she says to me, oh, you can't go now because the plane's boarding and you can't get your luggage on. And that's the last flight of the day, right? So I'm like, oh, that's pretty bizarre. Where is everybody, right? I said, well, I never saw an airport at four o'clock. So it's starting to feel pretty surreal to me, right? So I'm trying, well, okay. So I said, well, when can I go home? She said, well, we can put you on a plane tomorrow. And uh, and I said, well, they've been putting me on a plane where I'd end up sitting in New, New Jersey all day. And she says, no, if you wait till Saturday, I can put you on a nonstop flight. And I'm thinking, this is Baba working, right? Because I didn't think about it at first, but when I went back, they picked me up and I ended up doing this kind of thing for the full moon. And I didn't really want to go yet. And I was going because I had to. It was just so bizarre. And then I'm thinking, well, maybe that was really Baba because the next day when I went on Saturday, when I went to take the airplane, I said to a um, guy that was helping me, I said, isn't your air crowd crowded? He said, yeah, usually we go four or five in the afternoon. And I said, wow, that's a Baba because it, it that, it was it wasn't real, you know what I mean? It was like God of the dream. It was so so strange. It was like, where's everybody, right? I mean, you ever walk into an airport and you walk straight up and there's nobody around you and there's a lady that's standing at a desk and like, wow, that was that was one experience. But if I tell you all the things that happened the day before I left, I'm at the boat. I, I went to see the go to the lagoon cabin the last time. So I'm at the boathouse and somebody said, Well, you better pick up your dog because you know. She's looking kind of antsy, right? And I said, okay. And then I took a picture because it was a full moon that we see at moon. So I getting on the, when I'm on the airplane, I'm looking at the video of it and I hear this. And I said, that was the alligator, right? I think. Is that what makes a noise like that? But anyway, that, that was just one heck of a weird time, you know? So anyway, but yeah. I didn't feel bad or worried, you know, that I'm let, I think this time, I, I was asking when I went, when I, all year when I was thinking about coming here, it was because I wanted, I felt like I was being blocked from being free, you know, like being afraid of bugs and being afraid of being lost in the woods and being afraid of, you know, wild animals. And every time I go there, the Dooney fire a couple months ago, I was thinking I'd like to put fear in, but I know what happens when you put things in the Dooney fire. It's all, you know, you get really slapped with a lot of stuff. So I didn't write it on paper, but I kind of said to Baba, why don't you just do stuff that doesn't kill me? And that's what he did. He took away like, I mean, I didn't like to walk barefoot. And now I went to the ocean in the before I left. And before I left, I had a dream 
And I was really happy when I woke up because I was walking on sharp rocks in a parking lot, you know. And when I went to walk in the ocean, then it felt really soft. So I said, it's like, he gives you, takes all, take these little incidences where he's not throwing them at me really quick to like say, hey, I can deal with all this. And I came back home expecting to find clutter and craziness. And my house, I left it so good when I left it. I even had clothes to wear and I didn't have to, it was just, this, I had this wonderful, extraordinary experience. I was there for a couple months and it was like, it was everything I asked for and it was painful a lot, you know, but it actually I knew from experience with Baba that he'll push you through stuff, but he always, by the time you go to bed, if you really have faith in him and you obey, which is sometimes hard to do, you know, it works because it's just, it's just the way he is. He's a trickster. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And you made it home in one piece, you know. Said and I'm very yeah. happy to be home. I mean, like I'm really—I was happy where I was, and I'm even happier to be home because I was worried I wouldn't like being home anymore, you know, because I was so happy being around all the people that we saw on Zoom. I was there so long; I got to see a lot of people out of the box, you know. So it was like a real gift. Yeah, yeah, so I was lucky. Yeah. Okay. Brad. Brad, go ahead. Sorry about that, folks. I'm um, trying to maintain a uh, tolerable and operative uh, volume to my voice without sounding too loud. It, I live in a bedroom community, and the house I live in uh, has to have me. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're fine. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, anyway, you'll have to excuse me if I am not entirely sure what suffering is anymore. Um, I feel like I've been through like an inordinate, inordinate, if not very exceedingly high rate of pain and suffering. But then after it's all shrugged off my shoulders or if I just kind of let it pass right through me, it gets better. But yeah, I lay blame sometimes on others, but that doesn't seem to help. Not others particularly, just bad medical uh, operations. And and also I've found that not just a bad medical operation, but just the idea that you know, when you go to a hospital, you have to pretty much give up all your rights and you're at the mercy of them. And... Uh, I mean, there have been other times in my life where I've experienced suffering. I just don't know what it is anymore. I, I feel like it's hard to... Um, and one thing Baba does to me that no one else knows is I'll have visions sometimes of the, of visions of um, just helpful things to see from benevolent beings. And uh, without those benevolent beings, I don't know where I'd be today, but uh, it probably wouldn't look very good for the prognosis, but things have gotten better over the last uh, 12 years or so. And I'm still in a lot of transition in my life right now to focus on. So thank you. Yeah. Jay, Jay Baba. Yeah, Jay Baba. Fred, now. Now from 4.30 in the morning in Germany. When I was reading your email, I thought, oh, that's my story the last three weeks. I caught, For the first time in my life, I caused a car accident. Nothing major. You know, I just bumped into a lady that was already stopping at a traffic light and I damaged the car. And uh, it was still, you know, I was still able to drive and, you know, nothing really major happened. But I came home with anxiety up to here. I could barely breathe. Anxiety, feeling of, of guilt and feeling of shame. And I couldn't understand. And I thought, yeah, okay, I damaged the car, but it's not the end of the world. Nobody was sort of hurt in the incident. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the car is still driving, just needs to be repaired. 
And that anxiety stayed for me. You know, the next two, three days, I was unable to face the world. I was so up in emotion that I just, I just couldn't go out there. And sort of I talked to therapy, therapist friends and it got a bit easier and then it came back full, full whack. And the whole time, all I could do was talk to Baba because where else could I turn? You know, I sort of tried with friends that do therapy and it just wasn't working. So it lasted for about two weeks, that anxiety of not being able to face the world and feeling all those emotions. And then I realized I have a friend who deals with anxieties a lot. And when I visit her, I never know, will we be able to go out? Because she sometimes finds it so hard to go out into the world. And I try to be patient, but I don't think I always succeed because in my life, I have been so lucky not really having to deal with a lot of anxiety and um, emotional pains and that, you know. So I feel way more compassionate with her now. Now I really understand what it means if you can't face the world, if you can't go out there. So yeah, so A, I spent a lot more time with Baba, constantly really, because I didn't know where to turn. And then my heart really opened for her. And I think for a lot of other people that I know that I never truly understood what it must be like to, to be so frightened of the world. Beautiful, yeah. Yeah, beautiful, Sabine. Really, very touching. Yeah, I mean, this is one way Baba awakens uh, empathy and compassion in us. We get... <clears throat> You know, we we have some of these experiences that we've been kind of sheltered from, mm. and we rejoin a, a whole massive section of humanity as a result. Yeah, beautiful. Shri. We got Shri there. Oh, she. Oh, wow. She makes her appearance. Hi. Um. I thought this week's email was very beautifully written and um, I think in the beginning for myself and I'm sorry I joined late so I don't know exactly what you all have talked about um, in entirety but I think in the beginning for me when I first found Baba um, the world seemed like bright and beautiful and lovely and colorful and vibrant um and I don't know why and it might be more so a reflection of my internal state lately but the past few months um I I feel like that colorfulness has gone away um and I'm the questions that I'm asking are before it used to be oh Baba I'm so grateful that you created all this. I'm so grateful for you. And now the questions are more so, why did you create all this? <laughs> Is all of this here? And then um, why the heck did you create this? <laughs> and I've, I, I've been getting very angry with him recently. And I'm, I, I consider myself very fortunate compared to a lot of people in this world who are born into more unfortunate situations. And it really has just been angering me lately. Um, not only my own, like the things that I'm dealing with my in the things that I'm dealing with in my own life, but also the horrible things that happen to everyone on a daily basis. And so, I, yeah, I found myself, and I don't love him any less, or believe him and believe in him any less, or anything like that. It's more so just I feel like I'm becoming more comfortable with him in a way. Um, before I think I only knew how to love him, but now I'm learning how to talk to him, if that makes sense, um, and start this like dialogue with him internally. Um, but two weeks ago, when I was in like a pretty bad mental state, everything was bothering me. Um, I came across this passage called A Mighty Joke to Me, which a lot of you might have read, but in the passage, it's, it's a long passage and I can send the link in the chat, but in the bottom it goes, I'll give you another example. A Muslim after death is buried in a graveyard. After a few incarnations, he's born again in a Muslim family in the same town. 
It's customary among Muslims to offer prayers for the dead when they visit graves, to pray to God Almighty to save the departed ones. And so it happens that this person stands before his own grave and solemnly prays, may God save his soul. What an absurdity. Um, and I don't know why, but reading that made, it, it felt almost as if like a, a mental tension had been cut in my head. Um, and it felt really good because it makes you take a step back and like the title of the passage, this is all just a giant joke at the end of the day. And I think it made me realize a lot of the things that I was taking really seriously. Um, maybe I shouldn't, and maybe I should just learn to take everything at, at face value. And maybe that would help with my suffering. And I would say my suffering isn't even bad compared to what a lot of people go through, but just like anxiety and stress and all these things. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to share. And I think it was a very nice reminder for myself and maybe it'll help someone here as well. Hey, yeah, thank you, Shri. <clears throat> yeah, it, it's very hard to adjust to this world, to stay, you know, to stay, uh, keep your poise with all of the stuff that's going on, knowing that, that love is behind it all. It's hard to imagine. Love is really behind all this stuff. But uh, anyway. <laughs> Marian? Marian, you're up. Oh, oh hi. Thank you. And and uh, everyone, thank you for your sharing. So I wasn't quite sure how what I would focus on tonight because this, my life has been very long. And uh, <laughs> so I really wanted to be sharing i'm not going to go into my worst you know suffering in this life um because i am suffering every day uh when i read the topic tonight i thought oh maybe one week we'll have what do you do for fun and <laughs> so anyway with that i i have shared on this site and others and rt and all that in march 2021 i was in this hit and run accident that i almost died from and then I had, in a seven-month period, three near-death experiences. So I call it my practice, my practice for leaving here. And I also, I have a son and a daughter. They're in their mid to late 50s. They're late, getting in the later 50s. And four grandchildren, four grandsons. And uh, so some of, since I was in so much um, anesthetic during so much of those times, that uh, it was only later that my daughter would share with me that how she had to run home and get my end of life papers because the doctors didn't think I would come through that. And I'm thinking of what it put my, my son flew in from another state. I'm in New York. He's in Ohio. And uh, he, you know, alarmed because he may never see his mother again. So a deep compassion arose in me for all of those who I will leave behind. And, um, and I felt a gratitude because I felt it was kind of rehearsal for them too, of that, of letting go of me. And I felt that Baba's uh, compassion, that he is compassionate father. It really is in my face, this compassion. And with that is the intense, I think I know the difference between pain and suffering. They're not the same for me. And I feel my pain is more when sometimes I feel I love you, Baba. And I can tell it's me facing Baba. It's not me experiencing Baba's love for me. And Baba's made distinguishes in, in distinguishing uh, comments about this in the discourses and other places that in my like looking at Baba saying, I love you, I'm experiencing the distance between us. And then there's times I'm open and I receive Baba's love. And, that, and then I am allowing. And as Baba said, the way to love me is to know that I love you. So I can feel those distinct, I can tell those distinctions where I am bowing to Baba, loving Baba, and when I am opening to receiving and allowing um, the love that is there for me. So with that, I find uh, my old life doesn't fit anymore with all these traumas, and I still do trauma work, and I've had a lot of help about this, and even some old friends don't fit anymore. So this is all very painful. I don't equate it with so much suffering. Um, my suffering, I sense, is when I shift into being totally identified as a human being. Me, little Marion, here in New York City, having to cope 
with being a human being here on earth. And so with that, I thought, oh, that's what I need to distinguish when I am suffering. I'm so totally identified with being this Marian. Now I know I have a greater spirit because I've experienced my wholeness. I've experienced my oneness. I'm not going to go into that here tonight. So then, so what I'm doing to lighten it up a little bit is separate them more, human Marian and higher self Marian, who's expanding into the universe like the Baba wants in creation. Creation is an illusion, and I'm playing the game of being an illusion. Let me expand like the expanding universe. And then Marian is, human Marian is, I have my hands on my hips and is saying, no, I'm not going there. You can't make me. I will not go into that expanded state with you. And no, absolutely not. And then my empathy arises for that part of myself. And I've learned not to resist the resistance. Embrace my resistor and listen to her. So I've been really, really feeling very grateful for this kind of role playing. Because when I listen to her, I'll say, well, what would make you feel a little more comfortable you know, flying and expanding into this new un unexplored area. And she might say, well, it's, it's too strange. I have to have something a little strange. I mean, a little familiar. I, you know, I can't just step into this new place with not even knowing what's going to happen. And so then I'll find some empathy for her. And what I've learned for me to have empathy for that self, I have to receive it from somewhere first Empathy first comes from others, then I can have it for myself and another. And uh, I once had that confused, thinking, oh, I've got to find all this empathy inside. No, it's like a little baby first has to be taken care of and rocked and, and taught how to, you know, tie their shoes and all that stuff before they can do it for themselves and do it to others. So that has become a golden rule for me. If I'm feeling a lot of suffering and pain, I distinguish the two, uh, I need more empathy. I need to receive more in life. I need to find ways if it's not with it, with people. And as Baba said, the most direct connection with the divine is nature and the arts. If I get out in the park, I'm in New York City, Central Park's my haven, hug a tree, lie on the ground, get my feet on the ground. I just, I'm not trying to feel better. I naturally feel better. I naturally feel that flow with what of my true nature. Earth, air, fire, and water. And Baba said that's how the Christ comes into the material world. Earth, air, fire, and water. When I'm with that, I'm hugging my plants. I'm hugging a tree. I'm flowing. So for me, I love the word contrast. I go in and out of it all day long. And I get sometimes just fed up here being on this planet in this, this creation. So I just, I realize it brings me closer to Baba when I want to complain. I complain to Baba every day. And uh, then I smile. <laughs> so I realize I'm working with my personality because the complainer is the other side of the coin of the good girl. And as Baba said, we need to hold both sides of duality as the entry into the unitive state. So when I am with Marian complainer and appreciating nature and the arts, I'm in a flow. So thank you. I'll end with that. That's, yeah, yeah. the flow I'm in and out of suffering. I'm reminded of that line, suffering is inevitable, misery is optional. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, okay. So it's it's actually Terry, but she's a little too tired to talk. So I'm gonna jump in. Mm -hmm. the, uh, outstanding pleasures of um, being married to a Baba person is that sometimes you wake up and your pillow talk is about Baba. And uh, Terry said to me just this morning, I'm, I'm a little concerned that life is going so well for me now mm -hmm. that something terrible is going to like happen to you or happen to Hana or happen to Pri, you know, people who are really close to us so that I could experience suffering. And then we started talking about you know, suffering has its, you know, has its scale of zero to 10. And I don't know, I'm hoping that Baba doesn't think we have to have ultimate suffering in order to remember. <laughs> but, and I don't think that you remember him less when things are going well. No, I just remember. Yeah. 
I mean, I think I've said this before. I mean, quoting Baba, he who remembers God in his hour of happiness remembers God best. So when things are going well, just remember Baba. I do, because because if I don't remember when things are going well, then then he's got to get me the other way when things aren't going well. And then I, rem then I have to remember him. So, but yeah, you, you kind of worry like, uh oh, something could happen, but right. Yeah. You know, there, there's that old Jewish thing, you know, another shoe's going to fall off or you got to yeah. take salt and throw it over your shoulder and go poo, 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 you know, that, that you keep away the suffering totally. Yeah. And yeah. I think we need to have the colors of life. How'd I do? Yeah. Okay. There's a, it's a beautiful line of Baba's where he says, uh, and I, I've taken it deeply to heart. Baba said, it's infinitely better to hope for the best than to fear the worst. It's not just better, it's infinitely better because it's more in alignment with, you know, with harmony and love. Yeah. <clears throat> Rich. Yeah, I I wanted to be very careful about what I complained about or reported as suffering because I could do a whole litany of stuff, you know. But um, I think there was a, a, a quote of Baba's once on a calendar because I always get the calendar and I love the little quotations and all this. But I, you might correct me, Jeff, but I believe the word is by, 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 by regia. And I don't know if it's Hindu or right. Gujarati, but it, it in English you can't say it without a whole paragraph. But what it really means is I am so disgusted with life. I don't want to live anymore. You know, I hate this life. I hate it. But it's not smelling the trees that you hate. It's not the beautiful sky. It's not a dog barking or children laughing and screaming. That's not what you hate. I hate being trapped in the limitations of all my own suffering. And I hate it. And I'm tired of it. And I'm sick of it. But I asked Baba for help with this, and it's like, uh, 2,000 lifetimes, and you'll get there. Don't worry, you know. <laughs> Study the discourses, you know. It's like I'm going, no, I want relief, you know. I don't know what it is, but Bauji said that Baba had cut a hole from the gross plane into the first plane. So I know we're all moving along that path, and only with Baba's <clears throat> real help and assistance. But... I constantly suffer. That's my suffering. As you know, okay, I'm here. What? You know, I know, Baba, I know you're God. That is not the issue. You are the avatar, you know? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's enough. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I happen to think, <clears throat> I mean, I've observed this when, say, suppose you come into a room and Someone is kind of disabled in a chair and they get up, you know, they make an effort to stand up and embrace you. That the suffering that comes with that love really gives substance to that love. Then somebody that can just walk over and hug you. I mean, that's great too. But suffering, I mean, suffering gives a kind of someone who has to suffer in order to serve you or look after you or love you brings a, 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 a substance to that love, makes it d deeper and richer sometimes, I feel. I remember, Jeff, wasn't it Dorothy who was uh, a victim of polio? And she always wore the yeah. steel braces. She recently died. I always, yeah. when I saw her, every time I saw her, it's almost that's what I, what you just said. Just such yeah. strength. And when she made it, you know, she was struggled just to walk and everything. When she made it to India in her condition, when she went through Mondali Hall, the Mondali gave her a standing ovation. What she had to do, but we can just walk right in, you know, it, it was a great love. But anyway, go ahead. Um, Tony. We got Tony. Did Tina go yet? Uh, no, but uh, go ahead. Uh, okay. 
Yeah. Uh, so just I jotted these down because these splitting thoughts slid through. Uh, first, I want to say the previous share of mine was specifically because Jeff said, did you have an experience of suffering that led you to Baba? Um, yeah. Because there are so many other aspects of this. What got me to raise my hand now was Diane talking about the idea that if something good happens, that something bad is going to happen. And um, uh, my experience of that today, Elena was in the hospital for four day, four nights last week. And for a week before she couldn't walk, we didn't know what it was. She's fine now. <laughs> but, um, and she's walking around. Uh, but she just come into the center hall and she came over to me and she doesn't always hug. She's autistic, low functioning. Sometimes she pushes away. She came over into my arms and she just stayed there for this really long hug. And each time I was going to let it go, it was like, no, she's still there for this really long hug. And I was almost going to back a little bit, but she clearly wanted this hug to continue. And I said to Zeke, I said, you know, Elena is very spiritually aware. You wouldn't know it because she's nonverbal, but she's intuitive. She's empathic. She's, she gets stuff. She knows stuff. She sees stuff. And I said to Zeke, and she was holding on to me so tight. I said to Zeke, I wonder if she knows something really horrible is about to happen to me, <laughs> which is why she was, no, she was hugging me because she needed a hug and needed to hug probably. Um, this came up lately also that the, I've been doing work. It came up that I have a belief in jinxing. I don't know where the heck it came from that you'll jinx something if you talk about it or if you say it. And, and um, I'm actually doing some like therapy work to see if I can sort out where this came from. Um, and uh, someone told me the story of, um, who was it? Um, oh, it was Zeke. Her, her father did some um, detective work at some point and he would be in court a lot. And in, in Judaism, they say kinahora. It's like... Uh, to cast off the evil eye so that you don't get jinxed. Um, and she said he was in the courtroom and this old Jewish man was uh, asked uh, by the lawyer, how old are you? And he said, I am 84 years old, Kinohora. And he said, yes, but just, I just for the record, how old are you? I'm 84 years old, Kinohora. And no matter how he tried, he couldn't get him to just say, I'm 84 years old. He said, please, just tell me your age, nothing else. Uh, and, fi and finally, the prosecutor said, let me help you out here. He said, Mr. So-and-so, Kinohora, how old are you? He said, 84. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, what's the other thing? Oh, the best seems to me, in my experience lately, more and more and more, the best cure for suffering is radical acceptance and surrender, surrender of specific things, surrender of your whole life again. Doesn't matter, Baba does not mind hearing over and over if you've surrendered your life to him. And surrendering, accepting the circumstance, whatever it is. Um, I have so many things that get me distressed and I, I, I will re take recourse to, I accept this, I accept this, I accept this. I forgot Baba, but now I remember. So I'm accepting this, I surrender, accept your will. And the final thing I, I jotted down was, I don't know if you've seen the interview with Michael J. Fox with, um, I was going to say Barbara Walters, but she's dead now. But it was six, someone on 60 Minutes. Talk, talk about someone who has gone through an immense lifetime of suffering that it's almost unimaginable if you know what his, his MS causes for him. And somehow keeps a cheerful attitude about it and an upbeat attitude and jokes about it. So there are ways to, and, and maybe that level of detachment and acceptance is why he's going through this now. And though it seems horrible, he'll come back in, to another go round having gained an equanimity that most of us don't have. Just a thought. Yeah, beautiful. Hey, yeah. Thank you, Tony. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Tina, I think here, yeah. Yeah, um, well, uh, Tony Michael J. Fox has Parkinson's, not MS. Um, anyway, um, I saw an extraordinary show last night 
and it was a friend of mine. It was written by a friend of mine, and he has early stage Alzheimer's, and he chose to write a play about it. And, you know, I, I thought, wow, talk about making lemons out of lemonade. And talk about, um, you know, really, uh, he, he had gone to Switzerland to drink the cocktail to kill himself but he couldn't go through with it. And so he decided to write a solo show in which he acts out his frustrations with Alzheimer's disease. I just thought it was so incredibly brave and so uh, really courageous of him to try to have some kind of acceptance of this and help others and because he he is helping others by doing this show and giving them hope and so i i was very inspired by him yeah beautiful let's go with go here because we uh fred uh, fred had had uh this is the first go around yeah Jay Baba, everyone, thank you for all oh. your lovely shares. Oh. Um, yes, I've had my share of suffering too, and uh, it's a long story, and I think I've shared parts of it before as well with you, but to briefly um, give you a synopsis, um, you know, it was a long time in, in uh, coming after I got married and came here and, and went through many, many years of it. Um, but the upside of it was that it brought me to Baba even closer uh, because there came a time when I had tried just about everything uh, and it was like, you know, a yo-yo up and down, up and down over so many years. Couldn't understand it, couldn't fathom it. Um, this is, you mean when, when you were taking care of your mother? No, no, oh, this, no, this is, a, this is relative. Yeah. Yeah. Different. Uh, but had to do, um, you know, uh, so anyway, um, left me bewildered, left me um, very dis disenchanted, um, uh, disillusioned uh, in many ways, nobody to turn to because by nature, I'm very introverted, so couldn't really speak to it about so I, I suffered internally for many, many years, but the upside of it was that, in the end, when I finally came to the realization that it was beyond me to do anything. And I just turned it over to Baba and I said, Baba, whatever it is, from this day forward, whatever happens, I will take it as your will. And believe me, that was the turning point. And what I'm trying to say is that it's only when you surrender to Baba and give it all to him that things do begin to turn around. And for me, they certainly did. But um, recently I was reading, um, I've been reading Jean Adriel's book, Avtar. And she, Jean Adriel was an old time Baba lover um, the, from way back in the thirties. And everything that she has written in her book so resounds with me and, and my own experience. And she very, very poignantly describes pain and suffering. And she had gone through a lot of that herself physically, mentally, emotionally, all of it. And there's one little portion that I'd like to share that I'm gonna read from here and share with you. Um, she says, and she, this, was, um, this was when they had come as a group from India. She had spent a couple of months in India with Baba in the 30s and 37. And then they had come with Baba to Khan in France and, and stayed a while over there, a few months. And, everything had come to a head for her. And she says, the parting from Baba was an extremely painful one. In my farewell moments with him, I was moved to thank him for all the joy and pain of my life with him, to which he replied, thank me only for the pain. Now, years later, I fully appreciate the wisdom of these words. The expression fully, uh, the expression, um, 
growing pain is just as applicable to the spiritual life as it is to the physical. And without it, no growth is possible for the human creature. In the process of self-regeneration, all veils of self-excuse and self-pity must be torn asunder by repeated experiences of pain and humiliation. Were we free of egoism and self-will, our spiritual growth would be as effortless and painless as the unfoldment of a rose. The human, however, has to deal with the problem of conscious unfoldment, which requires a focal point, such as the ego, around which his impressions can be centered. But being only a provisional center, it must someday be relinquished in favor of the true God center. When this time comes, both pain and effort are necessarily involved in its elimination. In the ignorance which our ego fosters, we set up resistance to the activity of God in our souls when he undertakes to free us from our self-centered body conscious limitations. Were we enlightened enough not to rebel, but to accept fully the will of God as it manifests in our life, then our inner reaction would bear the imprint of joy. As one great soul has expressed it, we should be grateful for each messenger of pain that reveals at once our weakness and our self to us. Jai Bab. Beautifully, yeah. That's a very uh, memorable passage. Yes. You know, in her life, that exchange with Baba. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it, you know, like when anyone gives up addiction, yeah. You know, it's, it, it's not effortless. It, it's okay. a lot of work. And, and in a way, we're, we're all addicted to the bottle of self preoccupation. Yeah. So, which so, Baba has to break. That's right. So, I, I learned a big lesson in whatever I have gone through. Um, definitely, and uh, there's, it's, it's, there's always so much to learn, always so much to grow. And I have two beautiful quotes, which maybe I'll end with at the end of the session, Jeff. Okay, all um, right, yeah. <clears throat> you know, I thought I would share something. Uh, I, you know, uh, I think I might have shared it elsewhere, but um, back in the 70s, I did something that created such a psychic shock in me that it it created such a weird sensation in my head and it was uh, it was like and i thought it would go away after a week or so but it went on and on and on and you know i went into the lagoon cabin i said baba's name i just did everything you know it was like uh, and it just would not <laughs> go away. And uh, I went through like the rest of the year. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, like, the, like I say, the sensation was there. It was like weird. And so, uh, so I went to India and I spent a lot of time in a tomb trying to dissolve this thing. <clears throat> and it would not... Uh, you know, it would not go away. And I, you know, I, I usually would bring stuff up like that with Erich, but Erich was looking after his brother who was in the hospital in Pune. And so I only got to see him just as I left India. And I, you know, I went in the hospital room and he took me aside. And, you know, I said, you know, Erich, I disobeyed Baba, you know, and Eric just held me and said, if you never, if you never do wrong, how can he exercise his compassion? You know, and he gave me this great embrace and I felt it, but it's still, I came back here and it was still going on, this, this weird sensation. And uh, so I, then uh, a year went by, I came back again. I mean, I, like I said, I was saying Baba's name like crazy. I was spending time in Baba's bedroom and, and in the tomb and I, I mean in the uh, lagoon cabin so I come back a second year this thing is still going on I'm hanging out at the tomb trying to deal with this and finally kind of toward the end of my second visit 
I'm in Mondeley Hall. We, uh, <clears throat> Erich, is, there's been a morning session and everybody has eventually cleared out and Erich and I are leaning against the wall. And I said, you know, Erich, maybe it would help if I just share what, what, what I did. Maybe it might kind of lift this thing. Eric said, no, 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 don't do that. <laughs> I mean, because I had told him. He said, no. But I said, but it's, this has completely messed up my life. This has gone on. You know, why did this have to happen in my life? And, you know, we're just sitting on the floor and he looks over at me and says, but you've grown. And I said, I've grown, Eric, what do you base that on? And he looks at me and he leans over and he says, now you can't hold your head so high. You know, and, and, and much of the, my empathy in this life comes from that moment for others. Now you can't hold your head so high, you know. So a lot of these things that happen it, you know, that we wished didn't happen, do link us up with our fellow beings. And that's what he was saying, you know. Anyway, so we'll have one more, one last share, and then uh, and then we'll have some silence, and then we'll have Nasreen uh, 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 ring the bell and, and, and empty the tavern. Okay. okay. <laughs> empty the tavern. <laughs> okay, Fred, you're the last. You're up last. Jim, Jim, Mayor Bob All. Yeah. Um, I want to start out by saying that it is really the love of all of you and the love of uh, that we feel for one another that allows us to uh, stay God in the universe and. Uh, so it does help. I, I say that because I'm a bit lonely. Sometimes I don't really have any friends. So. Um, but I will say the the <clears throat> um, just want to make a, a quick comment on. So hopefully Tony has a time to share. But all I want to say is, uh, from my experience, from what otherwise could have taken many many decades to complete. Uh, we're, we really are the home stretch of things right now. In other words, when it says in God Speaks that when, it, when there's, if you ever watch the video of God Speaks, it, there's a narrator. Yeah. Go ahead, Fred. There was a narrator, a narrator that said that, uh, yeah, one day Baba will uh, undergo. Uh, wait, what was it again? Uh, that, one day what mom will do immense good for humanity and shake the world. And I think that time is coming upon us soon. I, I'd rather not begin to any specifics, but all I can say is we are on the home stretch. And just like Bob has said, I have hope if, if you be someone who's walked through my shoes dealing with the sickest, like the very exceedingly sickest and shrewd people of this universe, you can if you can do if you can walk at a my shoes, you're doing all right. <laughs> so, but honestly, I think it, what Baba talks about infinite suffering through infinite knowledge, um, that we kind of the more suffering we take on, the more open our minds become to, um, we come to like. I'm sorry, I have to let you guys go tonight. Okay. Well, let's have a few moments of silence. And then, oh, wait, let's have Goer re, uh, read something there. Yeah, I have a couple we'll have of a, uh, quotes that relate to yeah. our topic tonight. Baba says Untimely physical healing might retard the spiritual healing. If born willingly, physical and mental suffering can make one worthy of receiving spiritual healing. Consider mental and physical suffering as gifts from God, 
which if accepted gracefully lead to everlasting happiness. And there's yeah. one more short quote that I have. It says, Baba says, most persons suffer because of their karma. A few suffer for others. Masters suffer for the whole universe. Jay Baba. Thank Baba. you, Go ahead. Let's have a few moments of silence. Jay Baba. Now Nasreen. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> okay. You got to cl clear out the tavern here. Yes. <laughs> Avatar Meher Baba Ki Jay. Avatar Meher Baba Ki Jay. Avatar Meher Baba Ki Jay. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for uh, sharing and coming out, and listening and supporting each other. <clears throat> and uh, you know, like Mani said, don't forget it all has a happy ending. <laughs> my my uh, uh, Gmail signature says it will all work out in the end. If it hasn't yet, it's not. <clears throat> <the> <laughs> Yep. Hey, Jim. Well, thank you, Jeff, to everyone for sharing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Do any of you, do any of you um, I don't know if the name is so familiar, but uh, Will David, does anyone know where Will David is these days? Uh, he's been here in Myrtle Beach. Oh, know? okay. Yeah. For the last thanks, thanks, sir. several months. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hey, Shredda. Oh, I, I didn't know Shredda was here. Great. Out there in California. Jay Baba, Jeff. Yeah, Jay, Jay Baba. Baba. Wow. Fantastic. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Jeff, I want to thank you for your stories because you're like the old carpenter who, with one swing of the hammer, drives the nail all the way to the core. Oh. I love that about your story. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I, I'm I'm a living uh, a living uh, uh, what can I say? I made all the mistakes <laughs> <laughs> at one time or another. Yeah, I thought you were going to say you're a living legend. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, <laughs> no, close, <Well>, maybe so. <laughs> but um, and and there's this one quote that I like. I, I think I've said it here, but where Rumi says. When you're with everyone but me, you're with no one. When you're with no one but me, you're with everyone. And it's a beautiful thing. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know if I said this here or not, but the Mondelez stayed on that little property of Marizad with Baba for decades when they could have been out in the world and done all of these things because they, they knew that being with Baba and Mara is like being with the entire universe. You know, you don't have to go beyond them. It, they contain it. I, I think it like if if you take binoculars and you turn around the other way and look at somebody, they're they're, sh they're shrunken down. And I I, I kind of think we do that with Baba. We we look at them and we shrink them down to our <laughs> size. But I think a saint could look at Baba and and, and see him as <laughs> As, as large as the entire universe, hmm. you know, but we kind of shrink him down and, and but it's nice 
that he comes and and and, and Thank you, is here with us. But everything is contained. I feel in Baba and Mary. Yeah. Yeah. Oh boy. Oh, Mayor Sugar, I did, were you here? I didn't. Uh, I mean, I was kind of concentrated on just one screen. Some of these people came in from the other room, I guess. We <laughs> 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 were here. And now Sabine and and Johannes, they can go to sleep and then they can wake up and have a nice <laughs> breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> they start out at four in the morning, you know. Wow. It's 5.30 now. 5.30, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. And Mayor Prasad, have you got one? Uh, Mayor Prasad, have you got a, a, a quote handy right off the top of your head? Yeah, uh, yeah, I have a couple. Let's hear him. He, All right. uh, he's a connoisseur of Baba quotes. <laughs> okay, he is, uh, I think this is from everything and nothing. According to the law that governs the universe, all suffering is your labor of love to unveil your real self. Wow. And this is, from, this is from the ancient one. It is only your suffering that will bring you closer to me. And when you suffer, know that my nazar is on you. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's the view, viewpoint that Erich used to always give. Read that, read those two again. Boy, that's, those are beautiful. Yeah. According to the law that governs the universe, all suffering is your labor of love to unveil your real self. It is only your suffering that will bring you close to me. And when you suffer, know that my nazar is on you. Wow. Yeah, because a lot of people feel like when they suffer, they've done something wrong. I mean, and that is a, a, a great a block or hurdle to accepting suffering. And it's understandable, you know, like all this stuff is happening. What have I done? What's wrong with me that this is happening? And that's one of the difficulties in accepting suffering is feeling that it wouldn't be happening if I, was, if I wasn't doing something wrong, you know, and we take it personally, but yeah. It, it, or, it's, that, or it, that we've been forgotten. Yeah. Also. That we haven't. That that's nice to remember. That is that gives me hope that it's not that we're being forgotten, but maybe we're having a laser eye on us. Yeah. We're being suffering. remembered. Yeah. yeah. It, it's lately occurred to me that we so identify with our bodies suffering our mental suffering, our emotional suffering, and the grace of it is when it's just like so much that you say, this can't be me. <laughs> this can't be me, this bodily pain or this, or this mental thing that goes on and on, all these frightening emotions. They're there, they're there, but they're not. And suddenly like you're in the place where Baba is, mm, kind of that yeah. detached place. It's a gift. It's a big gift. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't come easy, but it's a big gift. Yeah. 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 If I were in charge of the universe, I, I would cut back on the suffering a lot. <laughs> Give a lot more joy and fun and everything. <laughs> but but no one would get anywhere. No one would get out of this place. It would have to be 840,000 lakhs of reincarnation. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, if you think about it, you know, we would just we would be a lot more lenient, and you know, we kind of soften the law of karma and make a lot more exceptions, and especially, you know. <laughs> hey, anyway, uh, here on the East Coast, we gotta go because we're keeping Jaysima from his bedtime. He's got to work tomorrow. Yeah.
Anyway, much, much love. Jay Baba, oh. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.